And welcome to the ACLU's Peter B. Lewis building here in Washington, D.C. Um, this is the panel called Three, Races, Three Faces of Racial Profiling. We're talking about racial profiling in the national security, border enforcement, and traditional law enforcement context. I'm so glad all of you made it here on this rainy morning. Just a little technical update. In addition to the live audience of policy experts and media from D.C., we'd also like to welcome our live stream audience from around the country. If you are watching online, you can participate on Twitter using the hashtag pound profiling with no space to encourage others to watch or submit questions for the panelists. You can also download a PDF document of materials handed out to people in our live audience which can be found on the live stream web or at www.aclu.org. Again, the hashtag is pound profiling. And if you like the program, we would hope that you would share a link to the recording with your friends on Facebook and Twitter. A certain president said, quote, racial profiling is wrong and we will end it in America. In so doing, we will not hinder the work of our nation's brave police officers. They protect us every day, often at great risk. But by stopping the abuses of a few, we will add to the public confidence our police officers earn and deserve. These were not the words of President Barack Obama, but they were part of a speech delivered in February of 2001 by George W. Bush to a joint session of Congress. During the tenure of George Bush and then Attorney General Ashcroft, the Justice Department issued guidance designed to end racial profiling by federal agents in routine police work. But the guidance allowed large loopholes for the use of race and ethnicity to identify terrorism suspects and to engage in border enforcement. And what we found in the years since the 2003 guidance is that the exceptions have swallowed the rule. Back in early 2001, why was George Bush saying these kinds of things? Why did Attorney General Ashcroft issue the guidance? Because in the decade before the 90s, we were rocked by big picture instances of police brutality and racial profiling, first starting in 1991 with the Rodney King incident, and then in 1999, a guy named Amadou Diallo was shot dead by four New York City un un unmarked, out-of-uniform police officers. So going into the 2000 presidential race, racial profiling was a huge issue. But it seems as though we've lost incredible ground since then. So the, today is about how racial profiling has surged and what we can do to stop that surge. Um, but first, a definition. Racial profiling refers to the discriminatory practice by law enforcement officials of targeting individuals for suspicion of crime based on the individual's race, ethnicity, religion, or national origin. Examples of racial profiling are the use of race to determine which drivers to stop for minor traffic offenses, which people to ask for citizenship documents, which mosques to surveil uh, because of national security concerns. Um, th those are a few examples of what we're seeing today. But, but the ACLU believes that guilt by association, guilt by skin color, guilt by religion and national origin are not American values. They fly in the face of innocence until guilt is proven and equal protection of the law. Worse, we believe that racial profiling is a violation of the Fourth and the Fourteenth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment guarding against unreasonable searches and seizures and the Fourteenth Amendment guaranteeing equal protection under the law. As John Ashcroft said, using race as a proxy for potential criminal behavior is unconstitutional and it undermines law enforcement, undermining the confidence that people can have in law enforcement. So let's get to the panel.
First, it is my great pleasure to introduce Congressman Keith Ellison from the 5th District of Minnesota. Representative Ellison is the first Muslim American to be sworn in as a member of Congress. He was sworn in on the Koran owned by Thomas Jefferson. He represents the most diverse district in the state of Minnesota, and he has been a champion on the issue of racial profiling and religious intolerance. And he, is, if you recall, recently stood up to Representative Peter King when he held hearings on the so-called threats posed by Muslim Americans. Before we get to Representative Ellison, and I'd also ask you to look at your packet because you'll have more detailed bios, I want to introduce to his left Joanne Lynn, who is a legislative counsel for the ACLU focusing on immigration issues, Mike German, who's a senior policy counsel focusing on national security issues, and Jennifer Bellamy, who is a legislative counsel focusing on criminal justice issues. They're just three of the many rock stars that I'm privileged to lead in the ACLU Washington Legislative Office. Um, Representative Allison, could you kind of give us your, your views, your feel for what, what it is we need to talk about, why we have to have this dialogue in our country now? Well, we need this dialogue because racial profiling is as bad a problem as it's ever been. And yet, uh, in the wake of 9-11, our country, I think, got a little distracted uh, around issues of, of law enforcement and how race, religion, culture might factor into law enforcement decision making. I think sometimes uh, we can get confused in, in the face of issues of, of security uh, around what's actually good security, what's constitutional security. And we can uh, just sort of like want to cut corners and sort of throw, throw a broad brush or, uh, and get sloppy, quite frankly, about how we protect our country constitutionally. Um, the fact is, is that if you go to law enforcement officials, they will agree, as you pointed out, that it's, it's illegal and unconstitutional to use race as a proxy for criminality or, uh, and, and dangerousness and then therefore go after whole groups of people who fit into a particular racial or religious uh, category. Uh, but at the same time, when you, when the, it still happens. The numbers show it. The numbers prove it. And most interestingly, uh, many people are resistant to legislation that could help root it out. If, we, if law enforcement officials agree that it's a problem, agree that it's wrong, then we shouldn't have any problem passing a bill. But we've had a lot of problems passing a bill. One bill that's going to be introduced soon, and I'll be an original co-author of, is the End Racial Profiling Act of 2011. Senator Cardin introduced a bill on October 6, big ups to him. And uh, Representative Conyers will introduce the bill in the House soon. I'll be an original co-author of that bill. And the House Judiciary Committee uh, may have a hearing on racial profiling uh, soon as well. Uh, the bill would do a few quick things. One, prohibit racial profiling. Let's start with that. Uh, enforceable, <laughs> enforceable by declaratory or injunctive relief. It'll mandate training on racial profiling for law enforcement officials. Now, this is a big deal because one of the things that has come out recently, and maybe the panel can talk about, is how some local FBI offices uh, have really have some very biased, poorly informed, downright wrong uh, information that they're imparting to, to law enforcement officials uh, regarding the Muslim community. One document I saw said that the more, uh, it was actually trained people to believe that the more devout a Muslim uh, uh, practitioner uh, is and how more, and how in, uh, the more they display religious devotion, the more dangerous or, like, or prone to terrorism that, that they may be. This is absolutely positively wrong. It's 180 degrees wrong, and yet it's being taught to people who are uh, empowered to, to enforce the law and who carry guns. Um, the condition, uh, the, the third factor of the bill, uh, it would condition federal funds to law enforcement on their adoption of racial profiling prohibitions. Uh, and then the fourth item would be to provide grants for the best pra police practices uh, and uh, to, so people can improve their policing practices uh, and discourage profiling. Finally, it would require the AG to regularly report on racial profiling practices. Now, let me just say this before I pass the microphone. 
We need legislation. We absolutely need legislation. It's true that legislation might not be able to change people's hearts, but it can change their behavior. And that's what we need. And I think if we have a national consensus that there is racial profiling, that it is unconstitutional, then we should do something about it. In fact, we have a responsibility to do so. I doubt we get much argumentation from law enforcement on the first two items, but the actual doing something about it part of it is where the rubber may well hit the road. And we're going to need every advocate of the Constitution and freedom of uh, individual liberties to stand up and be counted on this and to be heard and to not back down when people say things like, well, you know, profiling might be necessary to protect us from, you know, the terrorists, the criminals, the this, the that, the, uh, you know, who, you fill in the blank, right? Whoever the, um, the bad person of du, du jour, right? But we all need to step up as Americans and assert our constitutional prerogative, and this is a good time to do it. So with that, I'll pass the mic. Thank you, Representative Ellison. Um, I want to go to Jennifer Bellamy. Jennifer, um, historically, um, many people think about racial profiling as impacting African Americans, but we have a black president now. And do you think the concept of driving while black is outdated and because we're in a so-called post-racial era? And, and tell us a little bit about who's impacted by racial profiling in the African American community. How prevalent is it now? Well, it's absolutely not outdated. I wish I could say that it was. And, um, you know, the president, an African American president, which shows the great progress that we've made in this country, said himself in a 2009 conference that was supposed to be about health care. I think everyone remembers the controversial question that came up about. Professor Skip Gates, a Harvard professor who was attempting to get into his home. He had uh, forgot his keys and the police officer was called onto the scene to investigate. But would have sh what should have ended after he showed him identification, proving that he was the homeowner, ended up with uh, Professor Gates being arrested for disorderly conduct. I think the first you know, part of the analysis um, that shows that we are not in a post-racial era uh, is the backlash that the president faced after he criticized the police officer for arresting Professor Gates in his own home. Um, there was so much, there was such swift and ferocious backlash that I think the administration has been reluctant to take on some racial justice initiatives um, for fear of, you know, similar backlash occurring. So we're definitely not in a post-racial era, even though we've made some great progress. And the president said himself, uh, that the problem of racial profiling, it still haunts us. As to who is impacted by racial profiling, as we've already talked about a little bit, you know, for centuries, black men and women, if you were perceived to be in the wrong neighborhood, were subject to racial profiling. We thought of it as driving while black. Everyone knew of it anecdotally. Over about a decade ago, um, after September 11th, the idea that, you know, law enforcement officer could determine who was a, a likely terrorist based on their skin color resulted in a lot of uh, South Asian Americans and Arab Americans being racially profiled. And anyone who has read the, the headlines know what's happening in Alabama. Very sad circumstances where people are perceived to be um, here without documentation just based on the color of their skin and they are having um, you know these terrible interactions with law enforcement officers who are acting like immigration agents so I think you know several many communities are impacted directly by racial profiling but I think that we're all indirectly impacted by racial profiling because frankly it takes away limited law enforcement resources that could be used more effectively to protect all of our communities Thank you. Mike, um, it's fair to say since 9-11, people want to feel more safe um, and secure. And, and so what's happened, though, in our desire to feel safe and secure? What, what communities have been impacted? And, and why isn't a little surveillance um, such a bad thing? Um, unfortunately, as, as Representative Ellison suggested, uh, our, our many of the post-9-11 government counterterrorism programs have been based more on fear and ignorance rather than a true understanding of the threat. And, and uh, the congressman mentioned some of this uh, 
factually flawed and biased training materials that we revealed through our Freedom of Information Act campaign. Um, and, and who gets, you know, rather, so rather than focusing all the government resources on the relatively small number of people involved in terrorist conspiracies, entire communities were treated as suspect. And this primarily affected, of course, Muslim, Arab, Asian, and South Asian American communities who were subjected to increased surveillance interviews and interrogations, infiltration of their communities by informants, uh, more intensive scrutiny at airports and border crossings, uh, all without any basis for suspicion other than their race, ethnicity, national origin, and religion. Um, and, you know, in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, thousands of, of Muslim immigrants and South Asian immigrants were rounded up uh, and detained, often mistreated, uh, deported, although none were ultimately convicted of terrorism-related charges. Thousands more of, of immigrants from um, Muslim-majority countries were subjected to uh, excessive registration requirements that no other immigrants were being subjected to, based entirely on their religion and national origin. Um, you know, but there are also other groups who have been affected by this, and this sort of shows the ignorance of, of racial profiling. Uh, we work closely with the Sikh community and, you know, who at some airports are sent to secondary screening 100 percent of the time. And uh, one of our coalition partners, the Sikh coalition, uh, Amardeep Singh, testified in Congress and, you know, really gave compelling testimony about not just being subjected himself to this secondary screening, uh, but also his 18-month-old child being subjected to intensive pat-downs simply because of their appearance and the religious dress. So, you know, what's, what comes out of this and what's very clear is that these law enforcement and intelligence programs are being misdirected and completely innocent communities are being targeted for, for intensive scrutiny that, re, that misdirects resources from security away from people who are, who are real threats. And, and, you know, any time that the government is investigating innocent people, that's a waste of resources. Racial profiling simply makes us less safe. Joanne, before I get to you, I just want to ask Representative Ellison, in this time of cost cutting, do you, why don't you think the idea that this is a waste of law enforcement resources doesn't resonate more with the Congress? It seems to me if you've got, certainly if you hang everybody, you'll get the guilty. But that's not the American way, and that's not the cost effective way. What, is there any dialogue in Congress attacking these programs? Well, I uh, question whether we're in a, a cost-cutting time. I think we're cutting some things. Uh, we're cutting social programs to be absolutely certain. We can't seem to afford uh, home heating oil for seniors. Can't afford uh, Head Start. Can't afford, uh, can't afford stuff, like, you know, stuff like that. But, you know, when it comes to um, cranking up... Uh, you know, other expenses, we're quite willing to spend that money. And, 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 and unfortunately, if it will advance an ideological perspective, which is Americans should be afraid, very, very afraid, and uh, we whip up fear and hysteria against the other, uh, sadly, this is something that, uh, you know, certain folks are willing to spend a lot of money on. I, I, th I think that we need to confront the whole notion. And, and, but because I am one who believes that we should be extremely careful with the American public dollar. And this is a waste of money to just, you know, do these scattershot policing. We should do it. We should, we should absolutely uh, protect the American people, but we should do it based on good evidence that leads to tangible results, not just all of them. So, so I think that, um, you know, you raise an important question. It is sort of ironic that we're willing to waste money, but I, I, I question the basic premise that we're really, this is this era we're in is about <coughs> cost cutting. Joanne, um, clearly what started in Arizona spread to at least five states, that is states passing their own immigration enforcement laws. Um, <coughs> is racial profiling and immigration and border enforcement limited to those states? What's, what's going on in the country? Paint us a picture. Sure, absolutely. Thank you, Laura. I just wanted to say at the outset, because sometimes we get these questions about whether or not immigrants are protected from racial profiling by law enforcement, and I just wanted to clarify that the words of the Constitution apply to everyone within the borders of our country. 
and that's every person, whether they are a U.S. citizen or not a citizen. And our Constitution guarantees fundamental fairness and equal protection to every person. Now, the laws that um, Laura is speaking of are divisive and inhumane nativist laws that started in Arizona in 2010 and have spread to an additional five states in 2011. Those, uh, those other states include Utah, Indiana, South Carolina, Georgia, and the infamous Alabama law. Um, Alabama has kind of broken all records and has taken racial profiling to a place where we have never seen it before. The other states that I just mentioned all have racial profiling state sanctioned laws involving law enforcement. And what I mean by that is that they either mandate or authorize state and local police to verify immigration status of anyone whom they suspect is unlawfully present in the United States. The Alabama law also has that racial profiling state sanctioned provision for law enforcement. And that provision has been in effect since late September. It is being enforced on the ground today by Alabama state and local police. In addition to that, the Alabama law that passed and was signed by Governor Bentley included a profiling provision involving public school officials. For the first time, we saw a law go into effect where public school officials, educators, were required to verify the immigration status of all students at the time of enrollment, as well as the status of their parents. Now, fortunately, this part of the law was recently, very recently, blocked by the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. But during the two weeks that that part of the law was in effect in Alabama, this is what we heard. Over 2,000 students were pulled out of Alabama public schools mainly and probably all Hispanic students. Teachers reported that those students who were in class were shaking, crying, worried that their attending school would result in the deportation of their family members. U.S. citizen kids attending public schools, which they have a, a fundamental right to, guaranteed by the Constitution and by the Supreme Court, were reporting that they were being bullied, harassed, and intimidated and told to go back to Mexico even though they were born in the United States. And we've also heard about young children walking long distances to and from school by themselves because their parents are too afraid to get in the car and drive them to school because they, will, they could be pulled over by an Alabama trooper or deputy sheriff and then question about their status and refer to DHS for deportation. This is the picture on the ground in Alabama. So, uh, but just going back to your other question about the picture of racial profiling, I do want to clarify that racial profiling of immigrants or, and people of color, which includes U.S. citizens and lawful <laughs> permanent residents, is not limited to the conservative states in the Southeast and the Southwest. The Obama administration has made a, DA, a Department of Homeland Security program called Secure Communities the centerpiece of its immigration enforcement regime. This program has been hugely controversial and has been opposed by three governors, three prominent governors from the states of Illinois, New York, and Massachusetts, all close allies of the president. These governors have opposed secure communities because the program, although billed as going after the worst of the worst, has actually swept in 60% um, of the people deported under the program. You're good, Excuse keep me. going. Good? Okay. Um, do not have uh, criminal convictions that are involving serious crimes. Also significantly, just last week, the New York Times reported um, a new study authored by two law schools that found that 93% of people arrested under secure communities are Latinos, even though Latinos only comprise three quarters of the undocumented population in the United States. So the problem of racial profiling is not limited to a handful of states. It's being advanced and um, uh, codified by this administration. Joanne, thanks for that comprehensive overview. But I think it would be good to go to our video talking about the experiences on the ground um, with in Alabama. <laughs> The 
this is a third generation farm. We have 125 acres, and me and my dad run, run the farm now, it's K and B Farms. The day after the judge upheld the law, uh, I sat right here and, and paid uh, 64 people. At the end of the day, I had 11. So I went from 64 workers to 11 in one day. Some of these workers have been working in my family for 25 to 30 years. The ones that have been here, they're like family to me. They, they were really the first ones to up and leave. Just, they just fear the harassment. The fields still have to be cleaned up. We, we, we lay plastic mulch and have drip irrigation and stakes and string and, and all that has to be cleaned up and we, we don't have anybody left to do that, uh, which is a, it's gonna be a problem for us. If we don't get it cleaned up, then we won't, we won't build a farm next year anyway. Senator Beeson sat up here personally and told us that he thought that Alabamians, we would see where Alabamians would take these jobs and it's just not happening. So. It pretty much just uh, runs Alabama agriculture down while everybody else is, is still flourishing. If I cannot get my, my normal workforce back, then uh, I'll, I'll not even attempt to farm. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank the ACLU communications and advocacy team for going down uh, to Alabama um, right after the law was implemented and this is just one of four interviews available on the ACLU website. All you have to do is type in Alabama and you'll see interviews with uh, people who have been victimized by this law like this farmer. Jennifer, um, don't routine traffic stops by law enforcement real, reveal more evidence of criminality? I mean, aren't the police just doing their job? Some people say if you haven't done anything wrong, what's the harm? Well, um, you know, that's a really popularly held assumption, but the research demonstrates that, the ACLU's research demonstrates that even though, um, you know, black people and Hispanic people and other racial minorities are more likely to be stopped and searched, those searches are less likely to reveal contraband. For instance, um, the New York Civil Liberties Union recently produced an analysis of the stop and frisk practices of the New York Police Department. And over a period of about um, from 2005 to 2008, about 3 million New Yorkers were stopped. Now, 80% of those, 85% of those, um, were African American and 8% were white, even though, you know, we know the percentages, uh, New York City is not majority African American. And out of that, uh, the majority of the people who actually had contraband were the white people who were stopped. And so we know of this um, based on research and even the Department of Justice's own research reveals that when police engage in these uh, you know, stops and frisk and investigations in the course of routine law enforcement, uh, stops of minorities are less likely to re reveal contraband, even though they're more likely um, to be stopped and they're also more likely to be t detained for longer periods of time and subject to, subjected to greater uses of force. Um, before we go to a video, I just want to recognize two people in the audience and ask them to stand. One is Margaret Wong and the other is Jermana Musa, who are uh, leaders in the Rights Working Group. Would you just stand and turn around and wave your hands? <laughs> you have produced a great report and it's outside and it's available and I, I just think the audience needs to acknowledge your presence. Thank you. <laughs> If we can, can we go to the video? Over. Pulled over, sort of late night. Um, accused of being, as he put it, suspicious activity. So I was pulled over. Bill Mead area. Asked for my license, my registration, my insurance. I had it all, I showed him my everything. He's like, okay. So I've been interrogated a couple hours of interrogations out in the cold in the boxes and the other cops just having casual conversation, making me look like the fool. And, I mean, that's tough being a kid, um, but that's sometimes you go through that.
I mean, at the end, I was let go. No citation. No ticket. No reason. Only because, in my opinion, I was a Muslim kid in the wrong part of the neighborhood. So they said. I mean, that's, I've, I've seen a lot in my life. But to be degraded, I don't worry about stripped down of my clothes. Being stripped of my dignity was what I had a problem with. I mean, to run away from the injustices, only to come back and face it, that was tough. This is still the land of opportunity. This is America. People flee from other countries to come to a beautiful place like this. But sometimes they don't realize the harsh reality of it. Every beautiful face has an ugly side to it. I want to thank the Rights Working Group for allowing us to use a portion of their video um, telling this compelling story. Mike, you're a former FBI agent, so from the perspective of national and border security, we expect law enforcement to protect us. So how are they, these agencies like the FBI using racial profiling today? And isn't it some ask if it's an important tool that needs to be retained? Of course, I don't feel that, but a lot of people are asking, mm -hmm. shouldn't the FBI have this authority? Well, you know, I think this one person's experience shows that this isn't a victimless crime. And, you know, what, what law enforcement, I think, recognizes and why they are generally against racial profiling uh, is that it doesn't just misdirect their resources. Obviously, all the security resources that were devoted to interrogating this young man were completely wasted when there were other crime problems that could have been addressed. Uh, but also that it undermines community support. That, that uh, you know, for, for somebody like this to, to perhaps come upon something that's, that's truly suspicious, not, not pretend suspicious, uh, and thought maybe this is something I should report to law enforcement, you know, obviously he doesn't have any confidence that that would be treated fairly or responsibly. And so they'd be less likely to report it. And law enforcement in this country needs citizen support. So once the law enforcement techniques undermine that support, it actually harms our security. And any time the government acts illegally, I'm, I probably have this quote wrong, but I think it was Justice Brandeis who said, for good or for ill, um, government is the great teacher. And if the government acts illegally, you can expect that that's going to undermine community security uh, in the long run. Um, one of the programs that, that the government has now initiated is something that they call the suspicious activity reporting, which he sort of alluded to. He was being called suspicious. Uh, the unfortunate part of it is that they have de defined down what suspicion is. And what they've said is that suspicious activity includes things like, suspicious activity related to terrorism includes things like taking notes, and I see a number of you taking <laughs> notes. So right. un 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 unfortunately, I'm going to have to report that to <laughs> Homeland Security. Um, taking photographs. There were a number of people taking photographs or videotape, which we're taking now. Obviously, those aren't really suspicious. What they are is standing in as a proxy for police officers or the public in general to use what is their bias, whoever they're biased against, as a reason to justify reporting their activities. And the government is collecting these vast databases of this information. And most recently, we've learned uh, that the FBI is actually engaging in a racial and ethnic mapping program, uh, where they are making sort of crass racial stereotypes about who commits what types of crime, and then using that as a justification for collecting demographic information about the entire community and mapping where that community is for future intelligence operations or, or investigations. So, you know, this is racial profiling literally on an industrial scale. Uh, Jennifer, you had your, you wanted to get. I just wanted to add, I completely agree with Mike. Um, this is not a victimless crime. I mean, the ACLU has litigated a number of cases on behalf of victims of racial profiling. For example, uh, there was a case in Detroit where a number of, of young people, of young black kids were riding their bikes in predominantly white neighborhoods and the police would just take their bikes away and auction them off because they were 
um, not in, you know, they didn't belong there. And so it's, it's, it has a real impact on real people. And fortunately, uh, the ACLU of Michigan was able to settle that case. And there are a number of other cases. I think everyone probably knows about the Robert Wilkins case where uh, the Harvard educated lawyer was driving home from a funeral in the rain with his family and they were pulled over by a police officer who thought that he fit a drug dealer you know profile because he had a nice car and they just tore the car apart you know in the rain you know coming home from a funeral I think we can all imagine um, the uh, the frustration and resentment and the sense of helplessness that people would feel after being subjected to such unfairness um, thanks, Jennifer. Before I show you uh, what Mike was referring to in terms of, of what the ACLU is concerned about uh, concerning FBI practices, I do want to acknowledge uh, two real leaders in, the, um, in this fight for racial justice, and I'm not talking about leaders of the last decade or leaders of the, of the decade before that, but leaders who have been with us for decades. One is Stuart Ishimuru, who's a commissioner for the EEOC, who's in our audience. Stuart, would you stand up, please? We're so glad to have you. <clears throat> the other is uh, Floyd Morey, who has been head of the Nash Japanese American Citizen League. And Mr. Morey has been there at every step of the way in this post-9-11 trauma that the government has experienced. And in the, in within two weeks after the horrible bombings of 9-11, um, uh, Mr. Morey gathered people around the memorial and so that we could be reminded of how we overreacted during World War II um, and interned Japanese Americans um, in internment camps. And I would like Mr. Morey to stand up and he's been just such a great champion of ours. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to just go to the ACLU FBI webpage because I want people to understand the breadth of this tool. Mike? Yeah, uh, the ACLU is involved yeah, in a uh, The ACLU is involved in Freedom of Information Act. Freedom of Information Act. Freedom of Information Act. In 34 affiliates. In 34 affiliates. Where we're trying to gather. Where we're trying to gather information about the FBI training program and its racial map. Established a web site. Uh, where we were starting to reveal those documents. We've received thousands of documents that we're still processing, but we've revealed documents that show, uh, you know, a, a, a surveillance of the Muslim community in Detroit, surveillance of the Chinese American community in San Francisco, surveillance of the Chinese American community in San Francisco, of the black community, community in Georgia, uh, Latino community uh, and across the Latino country, community based across on stereotypes about based on stereotypes crime. about and this is happening all over the country and, and this is happening all over the country it is something and we're trying to address you know, by educating the public about it we've also written a letter to attorney general holder uh, asking him to tighten up the, the FBI's guidelines to prohibit racial profiling, but also to prohibit suspicionless investigations. Uh, so we're working hard to try to get this done. And of course, the Ending Racial Profiling Act would go a long way towards preventing this type of activity. Um, I just want to say, you know, we recently celebrated the dedication of the monument to Martin Luther King, and everyone refers to that I Have a Dream speech at the Lincoln Memorial. And one, one portion of that speech spoke to the fierce urgency of now. And we're in a moment where there's a fierce urgency needed from our coalition partners, from our friends across the country, but especially from the Obama administration and the Congress. And so, Joanne, I'd like you to talk about briefly what we need from the Obama administration and Congress, and then I'll go to Jennifer and Mike, and, and then we'll open it up for questions. Sure, thank you. Um, absolutely, we need to take all actions necessary and apply all pressure on Congress and the administration to halt racial profiling of Latinos, Asians, and other people of color under the guise of immigration and border enforcement. The Obama administration has the immediate power to halt racial profiling, and to, it must pursue several um, avenues to achieve this. 
First, we, are, uh, we, we thank and applaud the Justice Department for challenging the unconstitutional discriminatory laws that were passed in Alabama and Arizona. However, there are several other states that also enacted similar laws, including South Carolina, Georgia, Indiana, and Utah, and we would urge the Justice Department to challenge these laws as well. And we anticipate that other states may follow the Alabama example and be emboldened by the Alabama success from the nativist perspective. And 2012 could be a very difficult time um, in terms of the anti-immigrant onslaught in the states. Secondly, the administration, and specifically the Department of Homeland Security, which is charged with immigration and border enforcement, must immediately end all programs that encourage racial profiling. Um, there are several programs that do this, including Secure Communities, which is a program that's uh, designed to go nationwide by the end of 2013, the 287G program. Both of these programs are premised on the federal government partnering with state and local law enforcement. And what is particularly troubling about the Obama administration's record is that Secure Communities is currently been being deployed in jurisdictions where there are documented records of discriminatory policing, most obviously in Alabama, where Secure Communities is activated in 55 percent of all jurisdictions, but also in places like New Orleans, Puerto Rico, Suffolk County, New York, Maricopa County, Arizona, where the Justice Department, the sister agency of the Department of Homeland Security, has investigated local law enforcement for discriminatory policing and in some cases has issued findings and made very strong recommendations about uh, reforming local police practices. So there's a huge dichotomy between the two departments and we urge that DHS um, review all of its immigration and border enforcement practices to ensure that they do not violate the Constitution and do not violate our civil rights laws. And finally, we urge the federal government to reclaim its well-established authority to, for, to enforce immigration laws. Until it does so loudly and clearly, we will continue to see more Arizonas, Alabamas, and other states devising their own immigration fiefdoms. Thank you, Joanne. Jennifer, what's, what, is, what are the asks? What are the asks? So I think it's pass the Unracial Profiling Act. The, AC, the ACLU um, brought a case that uh, I think clearly demonstrates this need at the ACLU of uh, Oklahoma um, when Martin Luther King, you know, first gave his I have a dream speech that, you know, my sons and daughters will be judged by the uh, content of their character instead of the color of their skin. Uh, one of our, the ACLU's clients was about three months old and, you know, Many years later, um, in 2000, he could not drive more than 30 minutes in the state of Oklahoma without having, you know, being stopped by the police officer. So I agree with you. You know, we have to do something about this, you know, now um, if we want to actually um, honor what Martin Luther King was working towards, and, and this reflects our values. Mike? Um, you know, one of the things that the administration could do right away is enforce the guidance on the use of race in federal law enforcement. I mean, one of the interesting things about the FBI's racial mapping program is that, you know, it sort of exploited the loophole for national security, but then also used the same programs to target other racial groups based entirely on criminal matters, which should have been banned under the Ashcroft guidance on use of race. So simply by enforcing it, a lot of the problem can be addressed. And then Obviously, the, the, you know, this is one example of when you create a loophole, it quickly swallows the rule. And, and when once behavior is allowed, it starts to be allowed in other contexts. So we're urging the Attorney General to, to close the loophole for national security and border integrity investigations and to add religion and national origin as, as profiling as part of the ban. And finally, to, to also apply it to state and local law enforcement agencies that are receiving federal funds. Thank you. I mean, that's a long list. But fortunately, we've put that long list in writing for you so you don't have to memorize it. And it's in your handout. And it's also available online. And we encourage you to give us suggestions about additional actions. And um, I also wanted to say that Representative Ellison only left because he had votes. It was his intention to stay for the entire panel, and he wants to give all of you his regards and appreciation. 
Uh, so let's first give a round of applause to our great panelists. Thank you. And, and now we will open it up for questions. And there, uh, Sandhya has a microphone. So if you just raise your hand if, if there are any questions. No questions? I can't believe that. All right, Jessalyn. <laughs> Joanne, I was wondering, could you talk a little bit more about the Secure Communities program and how ex how it works and what how and what the problems are, how it's problematic? Okay, absolutely. Um, thank you, Justin, for the question. So, Secure Communities is a federal Department of Homeland Security program. It was first introduced in the final months of the Bush administration in 2008. And when uh, DHS Secretary Napolitano came in, she quickly made this the centerpiece of her immigration enforcement plan. Um, the way it works is that under the current system, when somebody is arrested for any type of crime, the, a, a loca the local jail will forward the fingerprints of that individual to the FBI. What Secure Communities does is then it automatically forwards those fingerprints to the Department of Homeland Security to check against their immigration database. Now, the way I just explained it might sound innocuous. However, the way Secure Communities has played out is that it actually encourages pretextual arrests. And let me explain why. Because if you are a local police officer or deputy sheriff, and you pull somebody over for driving with an expired tag or driving with a broken taillight, or not properly signaling before you made a turn. And these are not hypotheticals. These are examples we hear every week. Um, in 48 out of 50 states in the United States, you cannot ha get a valid driver's license without proof of lawful presence. So what we hear about is that people are pulled over, they get arrested for a minor traffic offense, they're pulled over based on the color of their skin, once they are booked into this, the jail where Secure Communities is activated, within four hours they are, they are brought to the attention of the Department of Homeland Security. The Department of Homeland Security can then initiate deportation proceedings against the person. So if you look at, for instance, the national data on Secure Communities, 60% of people who have been deported under Secure Communities have not been convicted of serious crimes. Many of them have no criminal records. Some of them have convic convictions for misdemeanors only. So what that means is that in some areas, secure communities is being used as a dragnet to sweep in people to get into the immigration deportation system, even if they're not being actually charged and prosecuted for the underlying crime. So, that's how secure communities works. Then you have to add on to the fact that DHS is absolutely intent on rolling out this program to every state and jurisdiction by the end of 2013, even though the program has engendered tremendous opposition in, in states and localities across the country. Um, the fact that DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, is operating secure communities in areas like New Orleans, Puerto Rico, Suffolk County, New York, Maricopa County, these are all jurisdictions where the Justice Department Civil Rights Division is actively investigating the local law enforcement agencies for discriminatory policing targeting Latinos and other immigrants. So you have the Justice Department enforcing civil rights laws while the, D while the Homeland Security Department is allowing these very local law enforcement agencies to channel people into the federal deportation system. So this is um, tr hugely problematic and notwithstanding all the outcry that has come from the community around secure communities, this administration all the way up to the president, him president himself has remained intent on rolling out secure communities nationwide. Thank you. Um, one of the purposes of this panel, and I, I see the question and we'll get to you in just one second, is to talk about some of the silos that we've been operating in. The immigration groups have been working on comprehensive immigration reform and detention reform and many other issues. The national security, Muslim, Arab, Sikh, South Asian groups have been working on um, national security uh, uh, interrogation, surveillance. 
And the traditional civil rights groups like the NAACP have long been champions of the End Racial Profiling Act. And I think one of the goals of this conversation is to break down the silos. So let's go to our next question. Oh, and the questioner has to be identified because she is a leader in a big <laughs> coalition. Her name is Lexa Kwame. She's with the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights, who, like the Rights Working Group, has been an outstanding coalition partner. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura, and thank you uh, to all the panelists. I have a question about the See Something, Say Something program, and many of us have heard the advertisements and see the signs on the metro. If you see something, say something, and in theory, that will empower us as private individuals to say something if we see something. I'm just wondering if you've heard uh, anything about sort of the, the impact of this program, um, the use, I mean, I think potentially it certainly has some profiling implications, but I understand that it's a DHS program um, and there's some attempts to talk with and work with DHS, but if you could just say a little bit more about what we know about the impact thus far. Thank you for Thank that you. question. Uh, see Something, Say Something is one of the suspicious activity reporting programs that I mentioned. So, so this is, has become a, a popular theme and, uh, you know, many state and local law enforcement agencies have their own program. DHS has See Something, Say Something. FBI has eGuardian. Uh, the Director of National Intelligence has the information sharing environment. And they're all designed to have activities at the state and local level, so, so reported by local police or, or people to their local police, funneled up to the intelligence community and law federal law enforcement community to be held in databases. And again, this, the behaviors that they identify in these programs include things like taking notes, taking measurements, drawing diagrams, taking photographs or video, uh, in some cases espousing extreme views. You know, they, they have real criminal activity. You know, one of the behaviors is stealing explosives. And I've said, yes, you know, <laughs> if somebody's stealing explosives, that's certainly something you should report. But when it, when it comes down to somebody note-taking, you know, what they're really encouraging is not, re you know, they, they would be quickly overwhelmed if everybody reported all the note-taking. But it's only people based on their own biases, whatever those biases are, reporting people who they're already suspicious of. And this is giving them a proxy to use that. Um, we worked hard with, with the Director of National Intelligence, the Program Manager for the Information Sharing Environment, and to their credit, they amended their policy, uh, requiring a reasonable indication of a connection to terrorism or criminality, also including some of the best racial profiling I've seen in a federal policy. The problem is there's no enforcement mechanism to ensure that those standards are being met, and these other agencies are creating their own programs that don't necessarily follow that policy and it creates a race to the bottom. In other words, everybody wants the most information, so the lower a standard you have, the more information you'll get. Um, so, so it's a real problem when these other agencies start running these competing programs. Um, and finally, we do have some evidence that, that our concerns about racial profiling are real. Uh, the Center for Investigative Reporting and NPR did a great series on suspicious activity reporting where they got all the suspicious activity reports out of the security at the Mall of America and found that there was a great racial disparity on who was being reported. So there is evidence now and we think it's, it's really time to examine this program because again, it's not just you know, the disparate impact, it's that it's a complete waste of information that you know, when, when they examined these suspicious act activity reports, you know, this is just completely innocuous information that's wasting everyone's time. It's clogging these intelligence databases with useless information. It's creating a cloud of suspicion that can never be removed uh, from somebody who's, who's reported in these programs. So it's a huge problem that, and unfortunately, these programs are growing without enough oversight or, or limiting regulations. So as a result of careless reporting of suspicious activity, someone could end up in a fe federal database and we wouldn't know how to help them out and we wouldn't know if that person applied for a federal job or a federal grant or a federal contract whether the government was in fact using <coughs> unconfirmed allegations to deny a person some sort of federal participation or benefit. And the, the group that seems to be most act, uh, attacked by this is photographers. And, you know, that it gets into some First Amendment activity where you see in demonstrations them going at the photographers and the videographers because that has been trained to them as an inherently suspicious behavior. 
Joanne, you've gotten another question, which is uh, from a tweet. How are communities across the country fighting secure communities? Um, you okay. mentioned the governors, but sure. maybe some activism too. Okay, well I will start that conversation, although I think there are actually people in, in front of me who can speak to that more directly. Um, so the, the opposition against secure communities is truly a grassroots movement. Um, and I, I can't attribute it to one organization or one entity. But where we have seen the most opposition has been certainly in the states of California, Illinois, New York, Massachusetts, but also in places like Texas, Colorado, Washington, and other states. Um, much of the uh, discontent with secure communities is the fact that the Department of Homeland Security has um, engaged in statements of misrepresentation is probably the most benign way to say it, but another way to say it is that they have lied. They flat out lied to county officials, to, to sheriffs, to governors about what this program is supposed to be. You know, as I mentioned earlier, it was designed to go after the worst of the worst, which everyone, like you know, Mike says, we want to go after people who truly pose a threat to our society and who want to do harm. But then the reality is, is that people are finding that domestic violence victims in their communities are getting caught up into secure communities when they call 911 for emergency help because of an abusive spouse. Um, no one, and certainly not law enforcement, um, wants a program like that to be in operation. So across the country, we have um, seen uh, broad-based coalitions of religious groups, immigrant rights groups, civil rights groups, victim service providers work together with their county commissioners in places like Santa Clara, Arlington County, Washington DC, um, Cook County, you know, New York City and other places to educate their county commissioners, their police chiefs about the dangers of secure communities. And then that is percolated upward to the governors to the point where in this spring, three of the governors from Illinois, New York, and Massachusetts told the, the president, told D, D, uh, the Department of Homeland Security that they do not want secure communities in their states. They understand that the program presents serious civil rights violations. So I actually, the, the, the happy side of secure communities is not where I sit here in Washington. The happy side is that this is actually an example of success where grassroots efforts starting ground up have really, I would say, started a revolution. And I think we're going to see more state bills being introduced in state legislatures in 2012 because of states discontent with the federal government around secure communities. So we are still very much engaged in this struggle at all levels of, of government and society. And I would like to say uh, thank you to our ACLU affiliates um, and our members because uh, we represent them here in Washington. We're not just policy advocates with ideas. We actually have a constituency of over half a million members and we attempt to serve the goals of the states and the local communities here in Washington. Um, so not seeing any more questions. Oh, wait, three questions. Yeah. Greg. <laughs> Another leader in the immigrants' rights community, Greg Chen. Uh, yes, Greg Chen from the American Immigration Lawyers Association. First of all, I just want to say thank you for having this panel uh, bring together these different themes as it coalesces around racial profiling. AILA is part of the Rights Working Group, which you acknowledged before, which tries and does a very good job at bringing those themes together, and it's just very good to have this audience here talking about that, so thank you. Uh, my question uh, in some ways is directed toward Laura, but perhaps also to Joanne. Laura, when you opened up, you mentioned the speech that President Bush had made uh, signaling the importance of ending racial profiling. And I thought there was going to be a request made to actually the president himself uh, in terms of what type of leadership there needs to be to do this, and perhaps a, a speech actually, or some kind of public declaration on that theme. I didn't hear it in the ask. There were very specific asks to the various departments, um, all of which I thought were very important. But I was wondering if you're going to make that ask. And it made me think, and this perhaps is more direct toward Joanne, uh, the request about uh, preemption, which was the need for the federal government to assert and make clear its primacy in federal immigration laws and its enforcement. I was wondering if that was the way that could be that could be done, or how would you suggest that be done? Well, I'll turn it over to you in a sec, but I just want you to know we have been very um, earnest in our um, uh, attempt to meet with the um, President's Chief of Staff, William Daly, and we think that meeting is essential. 
Uh, we'd like to meet with the president himself. Uh, we think this is a national crisis, the crisis of racial profiling in America, and it's leading to lawlessness on the part of law enforcement officials and lack of accountability. Joanne, if you want to talk think, about it. I think it's a good point to actually be directing more pressure to the president who, um, I think, you know, Jennifer mentioned this, and I certainly have had conversations with my colleague Deb Vagans, who's in the back, that, you know, the president um, has not made civil rights like one of his more prominent platforms, one of his, one of his uh, more public issues. And the truth is, is that underneath in his administration, certainly in the immigration and border enforcement context, he is rolling out programs that promote and actually are going to be retrenching racial profiling. So um, I think that that's, a, I take that as a good suggestion. I think the preemption issue, which Greg mentioned, that refers to the fact that we've had this struggle between fe the federal government and the states as to who can regulate immigration. And um, I think we would all agree that the federal government has not done an adequate job. And what has happened is that states and localities have jumped into that business. However, I think that the ask of the president and the federal government should not just be limited to preemption. I really think it should be that the federal government needs to enforce the civil rights of all Alabamans, of all people in these states. And as I mentioned at the outset of my comments, the Constitution and our civil rights protections apply to all people, not just U.S. citizens. It's a very important point to remember. Unfortunately, um, I've been given the signal we have to wrap up our program. I want to say thanks again to our live stream audience and Twitter, Twitter followers. And we encourage you to share a recording of this program on Facebook and Twitter and other social networks. What am I having a problem saying Twitter? Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> um, and if you would like the ACLU National on Facebook, we would be greatly appreciative. Um, and look to our website for other important policy issues. And we hope to um, encourage our coalition partners and uh, our, our litigators in New York and throughout the country to come to Washington and participate in these forums and take advantage of this great room that Anthony Romero, our executive director, made possible.